Hey, uh, Daoud, good to see you. How are you doing? Okay. Good. Um, so I'm very happy to be conducting this interview. My name is Jelani Cobb, uh, and uh, I am talking with the illustrious uh, photographer uh, Dawood Bey uh, today, which is you know, my great honor and opportunity. Uh, we attempted to meet before, we tried to catch up a couple of different times. We had attempted several times and I was in and out of New York. Yeah. Uh, it happens, so uh, it's uh, wonderful to be sitting here uh, having this conversation with you in this context for uh, yeah. Adama. Uh, likewise. Um, we have a lot to talk about, not a whole lot of time. We could, we could talk for two hours. Um, and the temptation always, you know, with someone who's been doing uh, the work that you do for as long as you have is to kind of do the retrospective thing, kind of go through all the different phases that you've gone through as an artist. Uh, obviously, we don't have time to do that today. Uh, so we're going to jump around a little bit and we'll start out with, you know, some biographical stuff and some artistic stuff and um, then we'll get into, you know, your work and uh, you know, the kind of arc of it to now. Uh, so, and also I should just say, you know, <laughs> welcome to everyone to the Adama Art Salon. Um, you know, very happy to have you back. All right, so let's just jump into it. Um, how did you start as a photographer? I've, I've seen images of you uh, with your camera that go all the way back so, so many years uh, and I know that you, you know, start out, you grew up in Jamaica, Queens, which is also where I grew up. Uh, and you're, you're best known for your work on Harlem. And I'd just like to know a little bit about the arc of your life and how you came to be uh, involved with photography. Well, uh, I started, I grew up uh, in Queens, New York. Uh, mm -hmm. And I believe you actually have that in common. Mm -hmm. uh, my beginning or my awareness of photography beyond the ordinary, i.e. in newspapers or magazines, uh, began with a visit to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1969 to see the exhibition uh, Harlem on my mind. Mm. And without going into too much of the history, the exhibition was a very contentious one. Uh, obviously, uh, America, and actually not just America, but America was in the midst of a profound social revolution in 1968-69, uh, in which people were speaking back to institutions in power of all kinds and that included the museum. And so this exhibition about uh, Harlem from the turn of the century to 1968 uh, was mounted at the Metropolitan Museum. It was very controversial for a number of reasons, uh, largely because it was an exhibition about the Harlem community and which the Harlem community did not feel that they had had much active input or voice or agency uh, in the construct of the show. And so this spilled over into uh, the media, into uh, the newspapers and uh, talk radio. And I was a very uh, socially uh, active teenager. And when I heard about this controversy, I wanted to uh, go to the Met to see what the controversy was about. I didn't necessarily want to go to see the photograph. I wasn't quite thinking that way. Uh, and so I found my way to the Met probably one Saturday morning or early afternoon. And, how, old, uh, how old were you at this time? I was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, first time I'd ever visited a museum on my own. And uh, there were protests, there were demonstrations, there were picket lines, and I basically wanted to go see what this controversy was about. I think I wanted to see the controversy. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
on the day I got there, at that particular time, uh, there were no picket lines. There were no and so, of course, I was initially disappointed. Uh, I guess part of the irony is that if there had been picket lines, I don't even know that I would have crossed it because I was politically conscious enough at that point that I probably would not have even crossed the picket line. So I, in, in the telling of my narrative, I like to say that they dictated that the protest would not be there that day so mm. I could go in and see the exhibition and begin my life. Mm. Uh, because there were no picket lines, I ventured into the museum, uh, was initially overwhelmed by the experience of being in this new space, alone, uh, not knowing where the exhibition was, being too intimidated to ask where the exhibition was. I saw droves of people moving around, walking back and forth. And finally, I just started walking around, hoping that I would find the exhibition. And uh, I did. And that was the transformative moment, seeing photographs of ordinary African Americans on the wall in this museum. And seeing people walking around looking at those photographs, giving them serious consideration uh, was an absolutely, I guess you could say, transformative moment for me. And uh, it was the moment that gave a deeper meaning to the camera that I actually had with me that my godmother had given me the year before. Uh, it was the first time that I began to think about what my subject matter might be. So uh, my interest in photography begins conspicuously enough with seeing photographs of black people in the museum. And that's pretty much gone on to take both the trajectory and the ambition uh, that I had for my work uh, from the outset. Mm. So tell me a little bit more about Jamaica, Queens, you know, at that point in time, as you were coming up, you know, was this a middle class community? Like, did you have encouragement to pursue your work? Was this the people kind of get what you were interested in doing? Like, how did, how did that frame? When I was growing up in uh, Queens, uh, I was at that point deeply involved in music. Mm. Uh, I was a drummer. Mm -hmm. and, in Queens, there was a very active music scene. Mm -hmm. uh, people have told me it's because you had uh, basements that you could practice. That's with. right, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you one quick aside from that was that uh, my eighth grade. In an apartment in, 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 in New York. You yeah. know, you had basements, you had uh, the backyard where you would practice in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was very easy to me other young musicians at that moment, and even to connect with an older generation of musicians at places like the Village Door, uh, where there were regular uh, performances of jazz music primarily. Uh, so growing up in Queens for me as I came of age was really about being surrounded by an immense end a, a community of young musicians. And that, and that continued in my first estimation uh, and moved to uh, Harlem. Mm. So that was my young life, really, uh, studying both traditional West African music, because there was Saturday morning traditional drumming classes going on, or, you know, uh, I was taking classes with uh, Mrs. Gray, uh, he was one of my first teachers, a drummer who's also from Jamaica Queen. So my my young life, the early part of my life, is very much uh, the life of a young musician. Hmm. So it's interesting. Uh, I mean, you know, from my frame of reference for Queens, which is that, you know, my eighth grade classmate uh, was LL Cool J, and I specifically remember him in eighth grade practicing his raps in his basement. 
uh, and then the same sort of thing, like uh, L, uh, Run DMC and uh, Tribe Called Quest and that, that whole flowering of hip hop that came out of Queens in the 1980s and 1990s. And it was more or less middle-class kids who had basements where they could go and make as much noise as they wanted. And eventually something artistic might come out of that. <laughs> so The basement seemed the center to the whole thing. Like you needed a space to do this. Right. And I think that's why Queens was such uh, a hotbed uh, of young and both older musicians. Because on the block that I lived on uh, in Hollis, there were uh, at least three different bands. Mm -hmm. There was a band across the street, uh, the guitar player uh, had a band, and then in the next block, the guys who ended up becoming the backup band from the bar. Uh, they were in the next block, and then two doors from them. But it, it was just a community of uh, young musicians, mm -hmm. uh, and it was and it was quite profound, uh, you know, when I think about it, because it wasn't just young musicians, but we were little, like we were serious, you mm -hmm. know, we were making, you know, we were writing music. Uh, horn players in the band that I was in. They were teenagers, transcribing John Coltrane solo. I mean, mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a serious and uh, rigorous pursuit, even mm -hmm. at that age. Which went on to shape the way I think about art making as a rigorous practice in general. That was my qu next question. Like, did that, how much of that did you carry over into photography when you started to pursue that? Well, I think what, what began to happen was that uh, temperamentally, I found myself uh, becoming somewhat frustrated with the group nature of making mm -hmm. music, mm -hmm. getting guys to show up for rehearsals. I mean, it was, a very, it was very much a group thing. And being in a band is like being in a family, really. And there's a certain amount of dysfunction that comes along with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, as opposed to the more solitary nature of being able to take this camera and go out into the world on my own and just see what I could make of it. Mm -hmm. So I think temperamentally I was probably more well suited to the uh, more solitary practice of mm -hmm. photography and art making, something that one could make on one's own that didn't require waiting for someone else to show up. So uh, in just a minute, I'm going to um, show some of your early photography from um, Harlem. And, but before I do, I want to preface it with something, which you know, the uh, photographer Henri uh, Cartier-Bresson uh, talked about the decisive moment in, in taking a photograph. And I know lots of other you know, photographers subsequently don't necessarily see it that way. But I, I did wonder like, about the early Harlem photography and the way that image after image after image seems to capture something intangible and fundamental about the subject, about the person. Like there's a kind of communication that happens through the medium of the photography about this person's humanity. And I wonder how you came about that. Was this your, your study of photography? Was this um, a talent, a rapport uh, for, especially doing street photography, uh, a rapport for interacting with people in the short frame of time before you're taking their photo? But how did you come to understand how to, how to do that? Well, fortunately for me, uh, my dad, every Sunday, he bought the Sunday New York Times. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started looking, of course, at the art section. Mm -hmm. And in the art section, uh, on the back page, uh, were listings of exhibitions. Mm -hmm. And I began to notice all the way down at the bottom of those listings was a little section called photography. And my eyes lit up. Oh. There, there are places I can go to see this. Mm. Uh, at that point, seeing Harlem on my mind at the Met had been a kind of one-off. Seeing these shows, and there were never more than one or two 
93, uh, listed in the New York Times, uh, became the beginning of my education. I would see an exhibition uh, listed, and I spent a lot of time uh, beginning to educate myself, looking at photographs. Uh, there was a photograph, uh, there was a series of photographs uh, by Irving Penn. One of the first shows that I went to see, a show called Small Trade at the Marlboro Gallery on 57th Street. Uh, I didn't quite know who Penn was, uh, but I went to see the exhibition. And of course, as a young black teenager walking into Marlboro Gallery on 57th Street, it was, uh, it was a pretty intimidating uh, experience. But I was insistent that I wanted to see these photographs. And that's how I began my process of self-education, was by going out, looking at photographs, trying to give myself a sense of uh, how does one translate the experience of the world into some kind of meaningful and resonant uh, photographic form. And mm -hmm. also, from looking at a lot of exhibitions, uh, I began to realize that there were things that resonated for me more than others. And the photographs that I went to see, including uh, Irving Penn, I saw a show, Mike Bish Farmer. Bish Farmer was a portrait uh, photographer in Herbert Springs, Arkansas, making photographs of uh, of his neighbors in Arkansas who came to him. Uh, I, I began to realize that the photographs of uh, ordinary people sitting or standing in front of the camera could actually produce something quite meaningful. Mm. Because those were the photographs of all the photographs that I was looking at, going out, looking at exhibitions in museums or galleries, I began to notice those things that I was more gravitating to that seemed to be more consistent with my own interests. And also, how does one go about shaping that? There's the patient, there's the world. How do you put those two things together uh, coherently? Mm -hmm. uh, so that was my early photographic education just looking at the listings in the Sunday New York Times and my dad loved the paper home. And then I was just, I mean, I was in New York. I knew it was 57th Street, but I mean, I, I knew my way around the city. And so I just started going out uh, looking at different exhibitions, trying to educate myself about the history of the media. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share a couple of images now, um, and we can talk to us a little bit about them. Uh, before we uh, get into some conversations about your more recent work. Okay, uh, we need to be able to share the screen so the host um, has to enable that. So we're not, okay, there it is. Uh, so, um, so talk to me about uh, these are some of the first photographs uh, that I made in uh, Harlem uh, between 1975 and 1979. Uh, these photographs come not only out of the experience of uh, being the Harlem on my mind exhibition, but out of the uh, out of my own personal uh, history, my mother and father had met in Harlem. Uh, you can see them in the uh, slide before this one if you want to back up one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's my mother and father up on the rooftop and here. It's a great image. Forty-seven on 153rd Street, and that's my mother and my aunt uh, around the same time, maybe a little later, also uh, on 153rd Street. They lived in that building uh, right behind uh, where they're standing. So the Harlem- did, did, did your parents live on 151st? 
151st in Amsterdam. So that, what's funny about that is that, you know, we both, we share the history of growing up in Queens, but I didn't realize we had the same sort of narrative because my parents lived on uh, 146th and Convent. Uh, oh, and so, and then they moved to Queens from Harlem as well. Yeah, that's right, by Convent Avenue back to church. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, we could talk, we could talk uh, some particulars oh, yeah. about the neighborhood after this. Um, so I think one of the things, this is the first image of yours, uh, you know, the gentleman with the bowler. Uh, the first image of yours, I think, that I saw that caught my attention uh, because there's just kind of indelible aspect of him, uh, you know, the, the kind of reserved, kind of dignified posture, but also a very dignified person that seems to have a lot of personality, not really a, a kind of staid, static person as a smile playing at the corner of his mouth. Uh, and you know, I wonder, how did this picture come about? Did you talk to him? Did you kind of say, can I get this picture? Like, do you remember your interaction with this person at all? Uh, it was actually, uh, this is what I call the first successful photograph that I, that I made. The mm -hmm. photograph of the man in the boat. The, the photograph that gave me a sense that I could in fact achieve the thing that I had said I wanted to do. And this is a man on 132nd Street, uh, Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I would go out on Sunday morning before church time because I knew people would be around waiting to go to sleep. And then I would also come back at one o'clock right after church service because then people would be getting out. And one Sunday morning, uh, walking, walking up 132nd Street, I saw this man and he was in a group with about three other older men. And they were, they were having a conversation. And I saw him in the group, and I knew that I wanted to photograph him. Not the other, but him. And that was the first time I realized that uh, making these photographs was not only uh, about photography and a picture making thing, but uh, required certain skills of social negotiation. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. was wanted to watch the conversation uh, between four older men and ask one of them if you want to make a photograph, not the other three. Mm -hmm. It seemed rather complicated. And mm -hmm. I was probably all of maybe, I don't know, 18, 19 years old mm -hmm. when I made this photograph. Uh, so when I initially passed them by, I didn't have the nerve to interrupt their conversation. And I walked all the way to the end of the block. And at that point, I'm telling myself, okay, this is what you say you want to do. And obviously, it's more complicated than what you thought. The mm -hmm. pictures don't just present themselves to you. You have to insert yourself into the lives of the subject and figure out how to make these photographs. But the photographs are not just standing there waiting for you. You have to actually do something to make them. So I turned back up the block, and now I'm thinking, of course, I've already, I just passed them by and said hello. Now I'm going to come back and single out one of them. It's all going to feel kind of strange. But I realized that if I couldn't figure that out, I couldn't, in fact, do and do the thing that I said I wanted to uh, do. And so I approached him, uh, just made eye contact with that one man, uh, said, excuse me. I don't mean to interrupt your conversation, but do you, do you mind if I make a photograph of you? Uh, at this point, he said, no problem. What do you want me to do? This, of course, he's got a whole other problem. What do I want him to do? I want him to do what he was already doing. Exactly. So, I'm, I'm suddenly realizing how complicated this whole thing is. You know, there's a series of negotiations, transactions, uh, figuring out that has to go on. And so I told him, why don't you just relax? And I'll make a few pictures. Just, and I suggested maybe you can just lean here and relax. You know, and uh, the rest was really up to him. Uh, and unfortunately, the best is opposed, you know, because what was most important was that I not impose myself on him. So mm -hmm. there wouldn't be any evidence mm -hmm. of a kind of tension mm -hmm. in the photograph, because the people are uneasy in your presence. That unease will 
translate uh, in the photograph. So I had to make it seem like the most natural thing in the world that I'm interrupting this conversation, asking if I can make a picture, I'm gonna make a picture of you, not to see someone with you. Uh, but that was the first time that I, I actually figured out how to do this thing that I had said I wanted to do, which was to create a kind of uh, honest representation of uh, African Americans in that particular urban community that pushed back against the more pathological uh, representations of black urban communities. And made something mm -hmm. that was more consistent with the family and friends who I knew uh, right. in Harlem. So um, I'll ask a question to kind of segue uh, into more recent work because you know there's a whole lot that we are kind of skipping over in the middle. Um, but the early Harlem work is you know distinguished for the street photography uh, that you did. Uh, but kind of just surveying your work, you know, in preparation for this conversation, uh, you've done portrait photography. Uh, you've done you know work landscape photography essentially is there a, a genre of photography that you find yourself most at home in well it's, it's interesting because you know i i spent uh pretty much i would say four decades uh making photographs that were largely uh centered on the human narrative. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it came a point where uh, I think with the Birmingham work, there, there came this shift in wanting to make work that was about specific uh, pieces, specific narratives uh, of and about uh, African American history, wanting to bring that history into the conversation that my work had the capacity uh, to provoke. And so the first group of photographs that I made as part of this ongoing history project were the photographs in Birmingham, the Birmingham district. Mm -hmm. But those were also portraits. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just a portrait in a very different kind of context. It was a portrait mm -hmm. in relation to a specific moment, September 15th, 1963, and the dynamiting of the 16th Street Baptist State. But uh, as I continued, you know, uh, making that work, uh, it's interesting because the work that preceded uh, the landscape work of the Underground Railroad, my come and tend to be black, uh, with a group of photographs that I made called uh, Harlem Redux, mm. that looked at how the geography of the Harlem community uh, was being reshaped by the forces of gentrification and the influx of the capital, and wanting to make uh, photographs that were not contemporary portraits of Harlem, but to look at how space itself is being transformed. So it was that work that was the most difficult mm -hmm. work. Because that work did not depend on the portrait or the human subject, but to give some kind of coherent state to looking at the narrative of spatial geography in Harlem. Mm -hmm. So that work uh, it took me about a year and a half uh, to actually figure out that particular vocabulary. So by the time I started the work that you were referring to, uh, my coming to the black, uh, that's related to the Underground Railroad, uh, I was pretty confident in going out into the landscape making photographs because I think previously when I was uh, making the portrait based work, I, I probably thought about uh, the landscape as a genre rather than the visualization of a particular narrative. I thought about it as a particular kind of photograph rather than a photograph that uh, 
for an embedded with uh, a particular kind of narrative information. So I think by the time I got to uh, my coming tenderly black, uh, I was much more comfortable, much more fluid in the making of that kind of photograph that mm -hmm. was centered on the human subject. Even as, as I was making them, I, you know, people often say that the human subject disappeared uh, in that work. But the way I actually thought about it, what that I was making was from the vantage point of looking out through the eyes of fugitive uh, African Americans moving through that landscape, trying to imagine what it might have looked like and felt like to be moving through the landscape of what uh, became known as the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. uh, Toward uh, Lake Erie and then on to uh, Freedom uh, in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really about finding uh, the conceptual and then the visual language and form through which to talk about uh, the things that I need to talk about. Which has kind of always been true uh, with the work because the Harlem, you know, my initial group of photographs, Harlem USA, was also uh, a certain kind of photograph, as much as it was a certain kind of uh, engagement with the Black subject and the Black community uh, in Harlem. There's always that challenge of how to wrap that subject in a particular kind of government form. Mm. And the thing too about uh, Harlem USA, you know, right now I'm working in a very intentional way with uh, aspects of African American history and trying to imagine them and visualize them. But Harlem USA is also based on my own family history. So that, so that aspect of history has always been present. I was there because my mother and father used to live there. Because mm. I had history there. You know. So um, I have a question. We're going to wait till the end for the questions, but this question is really right, right in line with what we're talking about. So I'm just going to jump in with it now, uh, which is someone uh, in the chat uh, posed this question, which is, do you have a specific process or relationship to the way you approach different cities where you've created photographic series, uh, Harlem, Detroit, Ohio, uh, Birmingham, etc.? Do I have a particular way that I approach it? Well, I think the, the approach has to do with several things. One of it is uh, a decision about what kinds of photographs to make materially. Because with the Birmingham uh, project, so while, while you talk about the Birmingham project, I'm just going to put up some images from it so you can continue okay. with this. Mm -hmm. Beginning with the Birmingham project, I started making that work uh, in black and white. Uh, because black and white is the material of photographic history. And I wanted this work to kind of materially embody uh, that history. I didn't want it to be a large scale and color, which is a very contemporary idea. So the way in which I uh, approach the work has to do with both a set of uh, conceptual decisions, uh, along with uh, certain material considerations. Uh, scale is a part of that also. I always think about scale. The Underground Railroad work, like Clement Kennedy Black, and even the Birmingham work, the issue of scale. To make something that has enough physical presence so that it becomes experience rather than the experience of looking at a photograph. I, I want it to become 
palpable experience. I once in the Birmingham work for the subject in the photograph to kind of push into your space and in a very uh, real kind of way. I don't want to get in, involved in talking too much about it because there's, there's a certain uh, use of this thing called the justice. To do with the manipulation of space in the photograph. But for me, the, the, the decisions are really decisions about uh, trying to make something that is consistent with the idea that I bring to that situation. And at this point, that situation is pretty much confined to uh, trying to bring African American history into a contemporary conversation. Now, I don't know if that answers the question at all, because I'm not sure uh, how the person asking the question uh, thinks about that. But for me, it's a set of material considerations, uh, also a set of formal considerations. Uh, the underground railroad work is also very large, their landscape. And I wanted them to be large enough for the viewer to almost immerse him or herself in. I wanted them to be enveloped in the work rather than standing back looking at a photograph. I wanted you to think of it more as palpable experience than looking at a picture. Mm. So can you talk to me about the Birmingham project here, like the decision? So you're referring to uh, the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, 1960, September 1963. Uh, how do you come to the decision to do this diptych form where you have uh, the two portraits that are side by side? Uh, and you know, what is that representing to you? Well, it took a while for me to figure out uh, the form of the work uh, with the Birmingham project. If you go to that photograph of Sarah Jean Collins, the girl lying in the uh, hospital bed, because that's where this work starts. Uh, when I, I, I knew that I wanted to make photographs about that particular moment, the dynamiting of the case, uh, 16th Street Baptist State on September 15, 1963. But when I got there, I had no idea exactly what I wanted to do. I just knew that I wanted to make some work about that. And so uh, I started doing research. I spent a lot of time at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. And it was in the course of doing that research that I found out that not only had four girls been killed that morning, but two African-American boys were killed in the violent aftermath of the bombing that same day. So the narrative was actually four girls and two boys. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I wanted to bring those two boys into the shape of the work. One of the things that tends to happen with uh, history, history is, becomes easily mythologized. Mm -hmm. There's mythic history and mm -hmm. there's the actual history. And actual history is usually a lot messier than mythic history. Uh, and I began to find that out as I spent quite a few years in Birmingham before making any of it. Uh, in terms of doing research, meeting people there, getting to know people, allowing people to get to know me, establishing my presence in that community. And what I decided I wanted to do was to give those uh, six African American, uh, young African Americans who were killed that day, a palpable, tangible presence. Because when you said four little girls, it sounds kind of fuzzy, it sounds kind of mythic, it certainly doesn't sound specific. Four little girls. Uh, I wanted to make photographs of 
an 11-year-old African-American girl. He mm-hmm. tells you what an African-American girl at that age looks like. So I decided to give those six young African-Americans a tangible present by making photographs of young African-Americans in Birmingham at that time who were the exact same age. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I thought that that left the work still feeling kind of incomplete that it didn't, it alluded to their presence uh, in a very strong way, but it didn't allude to the sense of absence or the sense of somatically disrupted possibility. And I, and I decided at that point to make photographs of African Americans in Birmingham who were the ages that those six young people would have been had they not been killed. Mm. And to pair them so that each district, in fact, because this I'm making this work uh, fifty years after that moment. And mm. so by pairing uh, a thirteen year old African American boy with a sixty three year old African American man. Mm-hmm. Each one physically embodies 50 years. There's 50 years embodied in each of these pieces. And it also gives a, a tangible sense of uh, lost possibility. And I decided to make these photographs in two different locations as a way of dropping two pieces of Birmingham cultural history around the project. Mm-hmm. One of the locations is Bethel Baptist Church. Mm-hmm. And Bethel Baptist Church was the church that was pastored in the 1960s by Red and Fred Shuttlesworth, mm-hmm. who hopefully some of you know. Uh, Red and Fred Shuttlesworth was an activist minister uh, in Birmingham. Uh, I tell people that in Birmingham, Reverend said Shuttlesworth is the people probably saw at Martin Luther King Jr. Mm-hmm. You know, he was there on the ground. Uh, and among other things, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, came into being uh, during a series of meetings at uh, Bethel Baptist Church. But so Bethel Baptist Church is a really uh, significant piece of uh, the history, African-American history uh, in Birmingham. And so I wanted that communal space of the Black church to be part of the narrative. And then the other photographs were made uh, in the Birmingham Museum of Art itself, where the work was going to later be uh, exhibited. And of course, like all public institutions in Birmingham at that time, the Birmingham Museum of Art was a segregated space. Black people mm-hmm. could not legally go to or visit mm-hmm. Birmingham Museum of Art during that time. Uh, so I wanted both of those pieces of uh, Birmingham uh, social history to be the setting in which the portraits were made to kind of wrap uh, those two pieces of history around the uh, the subject that I was photographing. And, and of course, if you think about an older person, uh, an older African American in Birmingham, coming to the Birmingham Museum of Art to be photographed. Mm-hmm. And not only to be photographed, but to later hang on the wall of that very same institution that mm-hmm. they could not have legally visited when they were the age of the young people in the district, that's also part of the uh, ambition of the work. Mm. You know, the, 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 the sighting of the work, uh, the context in which the work is seen is also uh, very important to me in terms of how the work functions uh, in the world. I just have a personal curiosity question here, which is, what did you shoot that with? What did I photograph with? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I always say photograph. Uh, 
I, as I always tell my students, I never use the word suit when you're talking about photographs. Okay, uh, what did you photograph that with? <laughs> uh, medium format, mm -hmm. uh, medium format film. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, film. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I'm, I'm still using uh, film. Uh, medium format camera on a tripod with studio lights. I'm not going to say any brand names. We get them. Okay. But typically, uh, it, it's medium format because I knew I wanted to make large, almost life size prints. Uh, and again, the question of uh, material from a medium format negative or a large format negative you can make a photograph of a certain kind that doesn't bear heavy evidence of the grain structure uh, of the film and other things to distract from the material quality of the description uh, of the subject. So just one camera, one light, studio light, be an umbrella. I always try to uh, light in a way that doesn't look like it's lit. I, I mm -hmm. it appears to be made in the natural light of the space that I'm photographing in. Because I don't want them to have a kind of theatrical quality. Mm -hmm. So there's a question here, um, which is uh, someone said they're curious about the conversations uh, that you and the people in the photographs had uh, and the conversations between the youth and the elders. Uh, during the making of the photograph, because I generally do not talk to the person mm -hmm. uh, unless once they're in front of the camera. The conversation, mm -hmm. uh, my conversations with the people, and this has always been true, even from the Harlem work, uh, I'll have a conversation and then enter into a kind of quiet, contemplative space to actually make the photograph. Because I need to create a situation in which they are not acutely aware of my presence. Mm -hmm. So I don't speak to them too much other than to gently direct their gestural behavior, to shape that gestural behavior to the shape of the picture, to the frame. Simple things like if the arm is sticking out too much and it's going to be cut off in the frame, I'll just say, you know, bring your left arm in a little bit. It, 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 at that point, I'm really a director. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'm doing is directing them, very quietly directing them to a kind of heightened performance of themselves, but allowing enough space uh, between me and the subject so that uh, they have their own space in front of the camera. I will say, though, on the technical side with the, uh, with the Birmingham work in particular, I use the longer lens than I normally do. Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. So that I would not be right on top of them. I wanted to give them, mm -hmm. I wanted to give them some psychological and mental space. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them certainly knew why I was photographing them. Mm -hmm. I knew what the project was, that I'm asking them to be there because they relate to the age of uh, this young person that I'm making work about. Uh, we have a conversation. And with the young people, uh, all of them were very acutely aware of what had happened mm -hmm. uh, that Sunday in 1963. Uh, but most of my talking to the subject happened before and after he makes the photograph. Mm -hmm. While I'm making the photograph, I try to create a quiet space in front of the camera. In the midst of this business, the camera is scrolled, my assistant is there. So I have to quiet things down to give them the space to reveal what I refer to as this aspect of interiority. I have to give them enough space so that this sense of interiority uh, momentarily comes to the surface. Because that's the thing that I'm interested in. I don't want it to look like they're performing for me. I don't want it to look like they're performing for the camera. I just want it to look like they're sitting there 
momentarily of contemplating and presenting themselves to the world. Hmm. So can we talk a little bit about uh, Night Coming Tenderly Black and how that project came about and uh, how you conceptualized it and, and executed it? Well, in practical terms, uh, it was a commission from uh, the Front International Triennial. They asked me if I would uh, be interested in making some work uh, for the Triennial, uh, which is held every three years in Cleveland. And I told them I would be interested, but only if I could continue the work that I was doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I did some research uh, to see what piece of African American history I could locate in Cleveland or Northeastern Ohio. And it quickly became apparent that uh, in terms of the Underground Railroad, Northeastern Ohio was very central to the Underground Railroad because of its proximity to Lake Erie. Uh, so that's practically how the project uh, began. And then I started doing research. And again, talking about the ways in which uh, history is mythic. The Underground Railroad is shrouded as much a myth as it is fact. Mm. Uh, partially because uh, of necessity, it was never supposed to be known exactly where the Underground Railroad were or where those houses and places were that were used as what they called Underground Railroad stations, where people would offer temporary refuge to the of African Americans moving across the land. Uh, but as I started doing uh, research, uh, it, it quickly became apparent uh, how little information there was in terms of what physically uh, survived uh, from that actual history, which then opened, uh, opened it up to me in terms of uh, the freedom to reimagine or to imagine this history within the landscape. There were a handful of places uh, within uh, Hudson, Ohio, and Cleveland, Ohio, where I was able to locate some actual uh, underground railroad sites. Mm. Uh, John Brown's Cannery, that house, a house still stands on the site. Of what used to be John Brown Cannery, and in Hudson, Ohio, uh, there's a street uh, that John Brown's son used to uh, live on, uh, and one and, and one can assume that if John Brown's son lived on that street, and they be an abolitionist, that fugitive of African Americans are moving through that landscape. Yep. Let's see if we can. Mm -hmm. share, some, share some of those images as well. Uh, uh oh. Yeah. No, that's uh, come up. No, no, not that work. That that's that's the uh, landscape of uh, plantation. Come mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Uh, come up to the one before that. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. And that that uh, the picture on the left actually is the site of uh, John Brown uh, County in uh, Hudson, Ohio. So a few of the photographs are made of what were presumed to be actual sites, but the majority of the work was moving through the landscape, just driving through the landscape using those locations as points of uh, departure. And moving through that landscape, walking through that landscape, driving through that landscape, trying to imagine it as it were, trying to see the landscape in the context of fugitivity and moving under cover of darkness through this landscape and trying to uh, visualize that experience 
uh, photographically. Conceptually, uh, the, the work uh, is also a material conversation with the photograph of Roy de Carava. Uh, Roy de Carava photographed uh, quite a number of them, uh, very dark, and they're about these rich black spaces and the black subject moving through and coming out of the, uh, the black, dark, lit spaces uh, that uh, they inhabit. And material, I wanted to use that idea uh, of Roy de Carava in terms of the blackness of the narrative, the blackness of the subject, and the blackness of the space itself, and that that around the narrative of the Underground Railroad in Northeastern Ohio. And then I was also uh, informed uh, by Langston Hughes' poem, hmm. uh, the last stanza of his poem that says, Night coming tenderly, black like me. Mm. It's nothing that that blackness can be a tender uh, embrace, but it's not a threatening space. Uh, this comes from the poem Dream Variation. Mm. Night coming tenderly, black like me. Mm. That but idea and De Carava's material idea forms the conceptual underpinning of the night coming tenderly black work. But it's, it's, it's a sort of homogenous conversation that goes to as much as it is an imagining of the landscape of fugitivity during the, uh, in the uh, antebellum era. So we're just about out of time. And I can't, I know this is terrible to ask this question, um, and we have about one minute to answer it, but I think it's important. I'll try. And the person says, uh, I'm a therapist by profession and a lover of photography. Uh, Dawood, do you believe your photographic work has generated any therapeutic benefits for yourself and or your subjects slash collaborators? Can photography be used as a tool for healing? Well, I believe it's generated a therapeutic purpose. Uh, that would certainly keep me sane. <laughs> Being able to make the work, it, that, that's my voice. That, that's the way I'm uh, able to uh, exert my ideas uh, in the world uh, in an expressive form. So uh, I don't know if you're using therapeutic that way, but it's certainly necessary to me. I think in the portrait-based work, uh, there's something uh, very important, I know, for the subject about being seen mm -hmm. uh, and having one's presence amplified in the world to be considered uh, someone whose presence would hang in a museum. Uh, mm. I, I know from the few exchanges that I've had with people that I have photographed, uh, how profound that is. Uh, so so I, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, literally using the idea of therapeutic, but uh, I, I think the work, the work for me uh, is deeply meaningful in a number of ways. If you want to call it therapeutic, uh, yeah, although that's not necessarily what I think about at the moment that I'm making the work. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we knew at the outset <laughs> we would have uh, way more to talk about than we had time. Uh, but I do want to show, uh, like if you're in Atlanta, uh, Dawood's exhibit, An American Project, opens in November at the High Museum of Art. Um, and here is uh, his book, Two American Projects, uh, which I really love. And also uh, this, which you know, has this kind of honored place on my bookshelf, um, Seeing Deeply is the amazing um, retrospective of your work. 
so thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, participating. Thank you for logging on. Uh, thank you, Dawood, for uh, sharing your time with us today. Uh, and you know, we'll see you next time.